For Ukraine, let's start with the good news. Long-range weapons from the West have finally arrived, more on the way, and the Russian offensive of the past months seems, seems to be stalling. Now the not-so-good news, as Volodymyr Zelensky lobbies a repair and reconstruction conference in Berlin, his country might be on borrowed time. We'll ask about plans to sell state assets to pay for the war, and Western backers looking over their shoulders after Sunday's European elections. The far right, who's a leader here in France, still owes money to Russia for a 2017 campaign loan, did so well in France that uh, the president triggered snapped legislative elections. Fears that supporting Ukraine could lead to World War III resonate with Marine Le Pen's voters. They also resonate with the far left. Now, that's the mood music that takes Zelensky from Berlin to Thursday's G7 summit. Uh, to the one he's organized next week in Switzerland to try and rally support for a long-term plan. What's at stake in the days ahead? Today in the France 24 debate is support for Ukraine on borrowed time. Joining us from uh, the capital, Kyiv, France 24 correspondent, Gulliver Krag. Good to see you, Gulliver. Good evening. With us as well, Ukrainian investigative journalist uh, Tetiana Nikolaiko. Welcome to the show. Good evening. Anastasia Shapochkina, lecturer in geopolitics at the French Political Science Institute, Sciences Po, president of the Eastern Circles Think Tank. Welcome back. Thank you. And we welcome from Washington, Elizabeth Brow, senior, uh, Atlantic, uh, senior fellow at the Atlantic Council uh, Think Tank. You're the author of Goodbye Civilization, The Return of a Divided World. Many thanks for joining us. Thank you. Your reactions on the hashtag F24 debate over the past two years We've grown accustomed to heroes' welcomes for Ukraine's president. Monday, it was Volodymyr Zelensky getting a standing O before the German parliament. But the co-leaders of the uh, far-right AFD party left the chamber, saying they refused to listen to a speaker wearing camouflage fatigue. The AFD bolstered by its second-place showing in Sunday's European elections in Germany. Eliza Herbert has more. When Zelensky addressed the German parliament on Tuesday, he positioned Europe as one in its fight against Russia. We will not allow Russia to continue to march through Europe. Putin will lose, he said, and Europe will be a continent without war. But noticeably absent in the Bundestag were members of the AFD. Just days after their success at the European elections where they claimed nearly 16% of the German vote, the alternative for Deutschland party decided to boycott Zelensky. The far-right party has openly supported Russia, as has the Austrian far-right party FPO, who were also victorious at the EU elections, securing more than 25% of the votes. They are part of more than 130 far-right members, entering or returning to the benches of the European Parliament begging the question, what will it mean for Ukraine? It's a topic front of mind for French President Emmanuel Macron, who lost dramatically to the far-right National Rally Party. And on the far right, at a historic moment in the country's history, clear patterns and positions have also been defined, leaving NATO, questioning again for some this relationship with diplomacy and our independence and ambiguity with regard to Russia. But it's a topic that comes with nuance. The National Rally Party has distanced itself from Moscow since the beginning of the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. However, its leader Marine Le Pen regularly criticises the extent of Macron's support for Kyiv. Meanwhile, the majority of far-right MEPs are divided. The European Conservatives and Reformists, with 73 MEPs, is broadly supportive of Kyiv, while the Identity and Democracy Group, with 58 MEPs, is accused of being pro-Moscow. While the far right is strengthened, it's not necessarily united, and it could be this division that keeps Europe's commitments to aid Ukraine unchanged. Anastasia Shapochkina, were Sunday's EU elections a game-changer for Ukraine? I think that the result, the especially the national result in France of Sunday's EU elections, was a big shock to Kyiv. 
And uh, definitely there is an apprehension of the rise of the right, because uh, to quote the Bible, where your money is, your heart will be also. And since all of the extreme right parties are funded by Moscow, of course, and the, par and the parliamentary role, the European Parliament's role, has been increasingly important on key decisions like budget vote, and hence defense budget decisions for Ukraine as well, and defense budget decisions for increasing European defense as well. Therefore, the rising role of the extreme right is very worrying for Kyiv, yes. Elizabeth Rowe, of course, France is not Europe and those legislative elections have not taken place yet here. Uh, are we scaremongering or is there a real, or do you feel this a fear here, a real concern for the Ukrainians? Well, there is concern for sure, but we should remember that that uh, a number of countries saw the, the far right not doing particularly well at all. And then you have somebody like uh, Giorgia Meloni, who did very well. Her party, the Fratelli d'Italia, did very well. And she uh, used to be described as being of the far right and, and is still being described as being of the far right, but is also uh, a, a passionate supporter of Ukraine. So it's it's not uh, a unique, a, a uniformly bleak picture. And it's also important to remember that people often vote uh, for, uh, let's say, populist or, or rebellious parties in the European Parliament election because they feel it's the safest place to to to, uh, to uh, launch a protest vote and then they vote for more traditional parties in, in national elections when more where more is at stake. Uh, Anastasia Shapochkina, just a question on this. There was a big exit poll done by Ipsos for France 24. Um, the war, this was on Sunday, right? Uh, speaking to people coming after they'd cast their ballots. Uh, the war in Ukraine comes up in seventh position, like way down. Absolutely. But tops was spending power. And on that score, we've seen natural gas prices that have jumped so much since Vladimir Putin's invasion. Uh, and they're due to jump again uh, here in France, nearly 12 percent between the first and second round of the election. So is there this association that uh, uh, the war in Ukraine, if it continues, it's going to hurt me as somebody who doesn't earn a lot of money in my pocketbook? And also, you know, this fear that, well, you know, this is, uh, will it, will, Will there be mission creep? Will we have to go fight in Ukraine? How, how much do you think the war in Ukraine did weigh on the vote? I think the war in Ukraine weighed more on the vote than uh, the actual response to this particular targeted question because of the repercussions. And what people were most concerned about, one of this is electricity uh, and also gas prices in Germany. Electricity gas prices are related as well. And also uh, they were also concerned about the general budget distribution. What is the what are the priorities nationally, right? And since defense is becoming the priority because leadership in countries like Italy, in countries like like France and even Germany understands that security of Europe is at stake. And so they bring defense into priority. That means that other items become less priority and that can hit uh, the uh, less economically privileged, of course. So that works and plays very much into the hand of the Russian propaganda. It plays very much into the hand of the populist discourse of the far right. The problem is that once uh, even if it is Le Pen who becomes, let's say, uh, who wins the majority in Parliament, let's say, imagine the worst, right? Uh, and then, or their al alliance of the right and something else is going to win the majority in Parliament, then how is it going to change the situation in terms mm. of the security threats are going to remain the same? The economic interests behind the commitments made are going to remain the same. And the same companies who worked with Russia yesterday, today, they have an interest also in selling the arms either to Ukraine or to other people, and they have the interest in developing the military industrial complex of Europe. It's not just about spending. It's also about eventually economic powerhouse in Europe, making Europe into economic powerhouse through defense sector as well. And it's about export as well. And this that's is- That's not gonna change. That's, I, didn't, I don't think that's gonna change. Mm -hmm. And no matter what populist company, campaign promises are made, that's not gonna change because there's too much economic interest right now already engaged. And when Macron, uh, the French president, left the eventuality of leaving the door open to sending troops to the front line in Ukraine, uh, could it have stoked fears among voters of World War III? The Russian Defense Ministry this Wednesday putting out uh, images of what it's billing as the second round of joint tactical nuclear weapons training with troops from neighboring uh, Belarus. Gulliver Craig, I, I know you you've uh, uh, repeated this often, that it's a big bluff, but still, uh, does that work? Are you asking whether it worked um, on 
um, influencing Europeans' decisions as to who to vote for. I don't think that it does. If you look at where the countries with the most anti-Ukrainian rhetoric did the best, you've got Hungary, where Viktor Orban's probably the most anti-Ukrainian, campaigning the most strongly on an anti-Ukrainian or anti-helping Ukraine line. They, his um, ruling Fidesz party had its worst score in 20 years. Yes, the AFD in Germany um, is you know, on a pro-Russian anti-Ukrainian line sat out of Zelensky's speech in parliament. But in France, uh, the Rassemblement National, which uh, won uh, these uh, elections uh, so, you know, stunningly, um, had really, really toned down any kind of uh, anti-Ukrainian pro-Russian rhetoric, felt that it was better to steer clear of uh, that topic. And when Volodymyr Zelensky addressed the French parliament, the um, members of Marine Le Pen's party not only did not uh, walk out, but they joined in with the standing ovations for all but two of them, for Volodymyr Zelensky. They didn't clap when he was uh, heaping praise on Emmanuel Macron. Uh, but uh, other than that, they seem to be trying to show that they too were willing to at least maintain some kind of support for Ukraine, which is perhaps illusory in reality, but it shows that they didn't think that, you know, this was going to be the thing to campaign on. You mentioned Germany's AFD, Elon Musk turning heads last Sunday, the boss of uh, Twitter, Tesla and SpaceX tweeting, why is there such a negative reaction from some about AFD? They keep saying far right, but the policies of AFD I've read about don't seem extremist. Maybe I'm missing something. Uh, Gulliver, uh, this, this is the same Elon Musk who controls the Starlink uh, uh, satellite, uh, uh, low orbit satellite system that's so important for Ukraine. Happily, he's still allowing uh, the Ukrainians to use the Starlink. I think that's probably due to not wanting to fall out completely with the US government. But I mean, Elon Musk's recent behavior. Does that worry you? It's, uh, well, Elon Musk worries me terribly. Yes. I mean, I think Elon Musk is campaigning for Trump. He's fight for the far right. He's, uh, I mean, yeah. You know, I've talked to you about this. I don't use Twitter anymore because of it. <laughs> Tatiana uh, Nik Nikolenko, uh, your, your thoughts on, on, on this, on uh, scene from Kyiv, uh, what's happening here in Europe? <laughs> um, for me, it's very difficult uh, sometimes to understand uh, all this uh, European problem because uh, now in my flat, uh, I don't have uh, an electricity and... Uh, uh, I uh, hope that I will be able to stay with you <laughs> on this air, but uh, maybe only uh, from the uh, light part of the day. Uh, uh, yes, I'm very uh, confused and maybe frightened from this, all these uh, results and uh, uh, straightening from the uh, right wing force uh, uh, in France, uh, uh, also in uh, Europe. Uh, uh, I think for us it's a big challenge, and uh, I support uh, President Macron's words that uh, Russia will try uh, to increase her, her influence uh, and block support for Ukraine in the Ukrainian parliament. Yeah, the, let's talk yeah. then about the, the, the situation. You're saying that uh, electricity uh, uh, is touch and go where you are uh, at the front, uh, claims and counterclaims. We can show you purported images of, uh, uh, well, here we see images not in, in, uh, of uh, some of the destruction from uh, 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 Russian missile strikes uh, uh, that have been hitting once again overnight several parts uh, of Ukraine. However, soldiers at the front say that uh, the long-range weapons have started arriving and they say they're making a noticeable difference. Momento, uh, since they granted permission for the use of weapons in the Russian Federation, C-300 and C-400 missiles have been used less in the city on civilians and, of course, on our positions. The situation with the logistics of our aggressor has changed significantly. They began to move less actively in this direction. Uh, Gulliver Craig, uh, that soldier in Kharkiv region there uh, saying that uh, the long-range weapons are making a difference. Is that been corroborated? Yeah, the front has more or less stabilized for now, and uh, Russia doesn't seem to have really achieved its goals with the new um, incursion that it made into the northern part of Kharkiv region. Neither did it take as much territory in Kharkiv region as people expected it to, even though no one really expected it to make it as far as Kharkiv city. They 
really didn't even, you know, they didn't take Bovchansk, which was the one town that they are still fighting for, but it doesn't look like they're going to. And they didn't capitalize on Ukraine having to spread itself more thinly by taking lots more territory in the Donbass, at least not for now. The Russians have made a few incremental advances here and there, but there's been no major breakthrough. But that's not to say there isn't going to be. The Ukrainian forces are still stretched, strained. They're still short of manpower. The firepower situation's getting a bit better, but it's still, you know, they're not out of the woods yet. Anastasia Shapochkina? What we've seen uh, in the in late spring, Russia tried to leverage the situation when the West looked paralyzed, especially the US looked paralyzed on the big chunk of military aid to Ukraine. And that uh, advantage was taken by ma amassing 90,000 troops just around the Kharkiv region, advancing there. And even at that moment, which was like, kind of one of the weakest moments, we say, for Ukraine militarily in the last two and a half years, they didn't manage to really make progress. So that, and then once the weapons started arriving, what we are hearing when we look at the Russian mill bloggers, telegram channels, we hear that they see a massive wave of new uh, equipment, of new uh, shelling power. Then also, of course, we read and we observe very closely the damage that it inflicts also the permission to use the weapons the West is giving to Ukraine, inflicts on the Russian military infrastructure and on their capacity to advance, not only now, but also potentially in the long run. And then uh, that, that shows also that this overwhelming manpower, so many people even here have argued that Russia is going to win because it has so many more Man. So it's absolutely going to give it advantage in the, in the war. We see that that doesn't give it advantage. It's technology which gives advantage. And if the West sticks around with Ukraine with technology, of course, it's possible to overwhelm the 90,000 people and overwhelm Russian technology because Western technology is superior. Yeah, but at the same time, uh, you heard Tetiana Nikolenko saying that uh, uh, she's worried about whether or not the electricity will go out before uh, this show is over. Uh, daily poundings by Russia taking their toll. Ukraine's power grid losing half its electricity capacity since last year. Tom Kennedy has more. Relentless Russian strikes on Ukrainian energy infrastructure that have left millions in the dark. Ukraine's state power operator has been forced to apply rolling three-hour blackouts in around a dozen regions, from Donetsk and Kharkiv on the eastern front to Lviv in the west. Parts of the capital are also in darkness, with citizens and companies who can afford it investing in diesel generators for power. Ukraine has gone from generating 55 gigawatts before the invasion to a current rate of 20. And this spring alone, Russian missiles have taken out plants producing 9 gigawatts. On top of that, Russian forces are occupying the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, which has provided half of Ukraine's nuclear power before the war. President Volodymyr Zelensky has been in Germany this week asking for air defence, but also to discuss the mammoth task of rebuilding the country's pounded energy infrastructure. Together we need to create our own blackout against Russian terror so that we can get out of these blackouts in Ukraine and into the possibility of peace. While the mild spring and summer weather have allowed citizens to survive the blackouts, more concern lays around the upcoming winter months where millions could be left in freezing temperatures without heating. Elizabeth Bro, that brings us to what we saw that clip there, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky in Berlin, of, of that two-day conference that, was, uh, that has just uh, wrapped up there. Uh, two-day conference that's uh, billed as a recovery conference. Uh, what was Ukraine asking for? What can it expect? So what, what uh, Ukraine needs to do, which is really uh, an extremely difficult task, is to continue conducting the war, or rather the defense against, uh, against uh, the Russian uh, armed forces, while at the same time thinking about how are we going to rebuild the country, uh, where is the money going to come from, where are the guarantees going to come from, because we should remember that, that any investment has been backed by, by guarantees. And so, it, it, and these, these are, sort of, it feel like abstract considerations, but the day will come when the war is over, and if Ukraine doesn't have a and viable reconstruction plan at that point, uh, it's, uh, the, the misery is going to last much longer. So it's, it's two tracks at the same time. And, and I think what Zelensky is trying to do is, is, is trying to show Western leaders that he, has, he and his government uh, have a concrete plan. Uh, his visit uh, this week wasn't helped by the fact that, that uh, his uh, reconstruction um, uh, 
head of reconstruction uh, resigned, but nevertheless, he uh, is making the effort to show that Ukraine has a plan. It will be interesting to see, though, whether and or rather to what extent he manages to convince Western companies, because it's not just Western governments, it's Western companies that have to be willing to operate in Ukraine to be part of this reconstruction, and they, they will want guarantees for those uh, for those operations as well, uh, it's especially in the early stages when there will still be a risk of, of uh, uh, some sort of uh, um, harm uh, being uh, being uh, imposed on their operations by the Russians or, or others. So, it, 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 as I said, it feels extremely abstract at the moment. But it has to this this plan has to proceed in a very detailed manner so that it stands uh, ready to be implemented when when uh, whenever this war ends. Gulliver Craig, uh, you you heard there Elizabeth mentioning uh, that that that. Uh, resignation of uh, uh, a senior uh, uh, cabinet member there. Um, yeah, I wanted to say, um, Mustafa Nayem, um, who was in charge of the um, Ukrainian National Agency for Reconstruction, in the post he wrote on Facebook uh, announcing that he was resigning, he also stressed, and I think it's very important to remember this, that reconstruction isn't just about post-war reconstruction, it's about the war effort as well, because it's roads, um, which are absolutely necessary for the military logistics, it's border crossings, which are necessary for improving the efficiency of Ukraine's exports and keeping the economy ticking over. These projects are also really important now for the war effort, so it's all the more of a pity that, I mean, he wrote that in his resignation letter, and it was a resignation that he was forced into clearly. And he is the guy with the strong anti-corruption reputation who was in charge of this agency. It very, very much looks as though they wanted to get rid of him because he wasn't willing to play the game uh, along with people who, you know, perhaps wanted to um, steal some of the reconstruction money. I mean, I wonder what uh, Tatiana Nikolayenko thinks of this. Apparently, the conference went ahead all the same and wasn't a failure. Tatiana? Uh, yes, uh, uh, we are all very uh, confused with this uh, resignation of Minister and uh, Mustafa. Uh, and uh, I understand that it's very uh, bad uh, signal uh, from the uh, Ukraine. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I don't think that this uh, battle. Uh, 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 we have essentially lost a case speaker on uh, this topic uh, in Berlin, but uh, um, you don't. You're uh, not sure it'll have much of an of an uh, of an impact either way for the time being. You're saying. So, so I, I uh, hear very bad your questions. <laughs> Yeah, 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 you're not sure that uh, it's going to have an impact either way as Ukraine looks to get more public and private investment. Uh, uh, yes, I agree with you. Anastasia Shapochkina? Yeah, I think that, uh, of course, it weakened Ukrainian delegation. In the press, we saw that uh, the, both the firing of the Vice Prime Minister for Reconstruction, Kubrakov, before Berlin conference, and then followed by resignation of Mustafa Nayem, responsible for infrastructure, uh, they uh, kind of weakened, very much weakened, left the delegation without two key negotiators, people who really, on that level, mastered the program. They were replaced by other people in the team. Zelensky didn't come alone. Own. Obviously, that, that I think that people who came to the summit and who were committed to Ukraine's cause, they also uh, didn't reject uh, their uh, commitment because they didn't seek Abrakov or Nayem. But it does send a message uh, and that does raise questions. And uh, what we would like to see, I think, what the West would like to see more of is more competent people kept and not just made to resign or fired, because that in the long run weakens Ukraine's image. And I think that what Ukrainian leaders must understand is that they, instead of infighting, which is also was part of Nayem's post. Because we were uh, talking about the Russian narrative earlier, which is that uh, Ukraine is uh, well full of rabid nationalists and very corrupt. 
I think this particular, uh, this particular, uh, these examples, they, they were, they were not so much about corruption uh, on their own. Kubrakov didn't, uh, wasn't made to go because of corruption, and Nayem did not re resign uh, over a corruption scandal. But uh, both of them have signaled, and Nayem very explicitly so, about the infighting inside Ukraine. And historically, that's what weakened Ukraine every time it had to face a major enemy, be it historically Russia or historically. Poland throughout its history. It also had weakened Poland, for example, historically before it was partitioned. And I think this is one of the major risks for Ukraine today. It is the keeping the united front in the rear, not just on the front lines. And there is this sense, if you read the reporting on uh, this conference, it builds a recovery conference. But for investors attending the two-day event, uh, it can seem like a fire sale of state assets to pay for the war. The New York Times uh, reporting uh, how, uh, you know, certain uh, that, 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 that there are, um, um, this summer, the government will auction some 20 state-owned companies, including Hotel Ukraine, the one that's right there on Maidan Square that you've seen if you've uh, watched those images from 2014, a, a vast shopping mall in Kyiv, and several mining and chemical uh, companies. Uh, Elizabeth Bro, uh, uh, there are obviously people who want Ukraine's best interest at heart, and there are probably bargain hunters, too. There are. And uh, what Ukraine is facing now under far more acute uh, circumstances is the same choice that many Western countries faced in, in the late 80s and early 90s, which was, should we keep uh, state uh, state owned companies in particular sectors especially in infrastructure or should we privatize and i think everybody watching your show will uh, will remember uh, margaret thatcher's fervent belief that that the private sector does these things better than the state does and so she privatized and and uh, launched essentially this this privatization wave and in many cases it has been successful in many in many cases the private sector does operate more efficiently then, then that's the state. But the, 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 the dilemma is you never know, you don't know beforehand, before privatizing, whether that will be the case. And you don't know whether particular sectors lend, within your country lend themselves better to privatized ownership, to private ownership than, than to state ownership. So it's, it's a big gamble. And I think Ukraine's advantage here is that we have all the these countries and all these private companies and former state, uh, state operators who can provide advice about how to do it so that it's as, as successful as possible. And they, I think, can also help Ukraine um, defend itself against the bargain hunters and, and profiteers who, are, who will no doubt be knocking very enthusiastically at the door of the Ukrainian government. Yeah, Gulliver Craig, I'm, I'm sure that everybody, of course, remembers the uh, uh, early days uh, after the Soviet <laughs> Union <laughs> fell, when uh, it was chaos. And um, I'm sorry, I interrupted you, and then I didn't hear your question. I remember the days of the uh, post-Soviet days when it was chaos, and there was cowboy capitalism at the time when it came to these private. Well, areas. a lot of state assets of Ukraine and other um, former um, communist countries, of course, in those days, got sold off for ridiculously low amounts of money, and that's how the oligarchs came into being. I don't think there's a risk of that kind of fire sale in Ukraine now. I mean, the numbers that I saw in that New York Times article, even if um, the sales are successful and the prices are reasonable. Well, it's still not a huge contribution to Ukraine's uh, war effort, considering the overall price tag that there is on it. But these are, you know, mostly companies that I don't think the privatization of them is really very controversial. It's not like their utilities or the railways or things like that, that there are really strong arguments against privatization. I don't think there are many people um, who've ever been to the Hotel Ukraine, wonderful though it is, who don't think it could be better managed if it were refurbished in private hands, because it's a very run down, uh, shabby hotel on such a prime piece of real estate in the center of Kiev. So, I mean, if that privatization is successful, probably going to be a good thing. And also shopping malls, I don't see why they should be state owned. I wasn't aware that that huge one in Kiev was until today, actually. Uh, Anastasia Shapochkina, did you know that? I think that, uh, of course, uh, even both the sale of the hotel and the shopping mall combined are not going to pay uh, for you know any percentage of the war effort. But uh, where I think the eyes are at, the main asset of Ukraine is agriculture. And the law allowing privatization of the land has been passed, was passed years ago during Zelensky's first, uh, uh, first kind of 
uh, time period in office, actually. And uh, then also there are companies, including in the military sector, which can be privatized and possibly improved or either uh, or even partnerships could be developed. Hence, the corporate reform of across the, corp the, the board of different companies, including Ukrabrom Prom, a big umbrella company uniting over 130 different companies. And the corporate reform of that company could potentially prepare for next stage for closer partnership, uh, partnerships with the European defense companies. Then you have also the privatization of very important assets, such as were mentioned, the chemical, whatever, natural resources companies and infrastructure companies like ports, which today cannot be sold at market value. But they are behind, and that brings me back to the 90s and your mentioning of it, also, of course, puts the question of how it's going to be privatized. It's more important than what's going to be privatized than how. Because, of course, the 90s have distinguished themselves by very opaque rules of the game. The open field, as you say, El Dorado, of privatization for a very happy few uh, who would be let into the process. And then a lot of many would be left out. And here now, I think it's going to be a litmus test for the Ukrainian government, whether they can make this process transparent and actually making sense. But yeah. I think that the, the key problem, though, is that there is no line of investors just lining up to invest because of all the risks, of course. Right. And showing that it's not opaque also and uh, applying rule of law is so important, Tetyana Nikolenko, because Ukraine wants to show that it can join the European Union at some point. Can, can you repeat your uh, question? I was saying it's important for Ukraine at this juncture to show that uh, it can uh, have a, a process that's uh, uh, transparent. Uh, yes, uh, to, 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 uh, transparency is very um, important for us, and uh, we uh, need to, to uh, make a s uh, signal for the European Union that we uh, combat corruption or uh, that. Uh, uh, we uh, stay better in the uh, difficult. Uh, uh... Yeah, to, to to be to be less uh, to 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 show that uh, that Ukraine is capable uh, on that score, and as it turns west. So, okay, Anastasia Shapochkina, we had the recovery conference, as it's called in Berlin, and then there's going to be next week in Switzerland. This uh, what's called a peace, a peace summit. Russia's not invited. China's not attending. Is it? What? what, what how would you label it? First of all, this thing that's happening. Oh, I think that the peace summit is designed by the, as far as I understand, by the Ukrainian diplomatic establishment as a, as as a way to regroup as many nations as possible behind the peace plan of President Zelensky, and it's a way to also test the diplomatic effort of the last two and a half years to see if Ukraine can actually gather as a sign of support, international support, not just Western partners, but also as many as possible partners from the global south, and thus showing and making people show. As we're speaking, uh, the uh, Ukrainian president has uh, taken a quick trip away from Europe to Saudi Arabia. He's met with uh, the crown prince there. Not very logical, but exactly. See, like, in terms of geography, and but he's very logical this is all in about terms of the week. peace it's process. Right. Exactly. Because, of course, Saudi Arabia as a crucial regional actor, anti-Iran actor, while Iran being aligned with Russia, Saudi Arabia is traditionally aligned either with the US or against Iran, at least more recently. And this is a crucial player who can influence other countries in the region. Because what Ukraine is aiming at at the peace summit is not just quality, but also quantity. And aiming to kind of make it as an alternative to the UN General Assembly gatherings and votings where Russia is very heavily present and influencing as an alternative kind of gathering to show how much support it can actually garner. And this is going to be a real test, I think, to Ukrainian diplomacy, really, just to show for it. However, of course, whether about peace, we're going to see any breakthroughs. I do not expect to see any actual breakthroughs about peace. It's not about peace negotiations. It's about the support for Ukraine, diplomatic support, and then behind diplomatic support, countries like Saudi Arabia, of course, can play a much greater role, about which I expect them to be more circumspect. Uh, Elizabeth Bro, uh, Zelensky very badly wanted Joe Biden to attend. It's not going to happen. Instead, he's going to send his vice president, Kamala Harris. Why, why, does he, why has Ukraine's president invested so much political capital in this uh, summit next week in Switzerland? 
Well, as, as was just said, it's, it's an effort to show that the countries supporting Ukraine in this war are not just Western countries. And, and uh, from my own experience, for example, when I, when I uh, talk to Indian audiences, I always say, well, you know, the West shouldn't tell us what position to, tell about, to, to take on Ukraine, and we decide for ourselves. So it's important for, for Zelensky to be able to show that support for Ukraine is not just a Western thing. It's not just a Western dictated thing. And that really matters beyond the diplomatic gestures because a number of non-Western countries uh, have essentially remained on the sidelines and while being on the sidelines have also uh, directly or indirectly been supporting uh, the Russian economy by continuing to, tr to trade with Russia because they haven't imposed sanctions. They essentially uh, not only continue to trade with Russia but undermine Western sanctions and, and they would say, well, it's up to us whom we trade with, uh, but uh, that uh, essentially, well, it strengthens, strengthens Russia, weakens Ukraine, even as their diplomatic uh, posture is that they are neutral. So that as many of these countries, as Zelensky can, can convince to publicly side with Ukraine in some fashion, uh, the better it is for, 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 for Ukraine in this war, uh, regardless of the outcome of, of any talks at, at this peace summit or anywhere else. Uh, Gulliver Craig, uh, uh, Zelensky, how's it being felt where you are? The the fact that he's he's gone off on you know for all these for all this summitry. Uh, the, 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 uh, the, there have been some opposition voices criticizing him for being away from the country for such a long time. He was in Singapore, the Philippines, then he came back for one day, then he went to Sweden, then of course France, Germany. Now these, but these are all really very important meetings, and I think that you know. There's a broad understanding um, of what the idea of this so-called peace summit um, in Switzerland is. And I think even Ukrainians who are critical of Zelensky and his team on a number of issues aren't really um, suggesting that this isn't fundamentally a good idea, because clearly the idea of breaking the Russian narrative of Russia and the rest versus uh, the West by showing that Ukraine's got a lot of countries from the rest of the world on its side as well is, is not a bad idea in itself. But um, the way things are going with the preparations of it, um, it doesn't look that good. I mean, earlier Ukrainians were saying that if they had 100 countries taking part, they'd call it a success. And they were expecting at least Joe Biden to be that. They were expecting the Chinese to be represented, albeit at a lower level. The Chinese aren't coming. They're putting forward a different proposal. Joe Biden's not coming, and it looks like falling well short of the um, target of 100 countries. So, um, you know, we'll see what happens in Switzerland. Um, we'll see whether or not there is a final declaration at the, uh, at the end of this uh, summit. I mean, I think that if there is, the Ukrainians will feel that they've got something to work with going forward. If there isn't, then some people in Ukraine may be saying that the Zelensky team managed it badly and um, flopped it. Z Zelensky has had the Midas touch since, uh, at least on the world stage, uh, since February uh, uh, of 2022. But from what we've just talked about so far in this discussion, Anastasia Shapochkina, this cabinet shakeup ahead of a big conference where you're trying to convince people that you're a good country to invest in, N the fact that they're not going to get as many uh, participants in this peace summit next week as they would have liked, is Zelensky losing the magic, the, the Midas touch? Yeah, I think that there is a kind of different uh, ways of seeing it, right? We see this is this is what's on the surface, so to say. This is the what's what's going on. Now, on the other hand, when you fix a big target and you announce it, that that looks very good, but also it's target for yourself. It means that even if you fall short of it, it may still be good for you because it depends who are the people who are actually going to show up who wouldn't have shown up in the General Assembly of the UN if the big regional players, heavyweights like Saudi Arabia, are brought on board, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I don't know if there was a realistic expectation that Biden is going to actually again come to Europe in such a short time, even given his health, physical condition, honestly. But he has to be at the G7, and it's Yeah, let's talk about that. Before Bergenstock in Switzerland, there's a G7 summit in Italy. Uh, he's, he's already on, boarded the Air Force One, and it's coming that back to That didn't Europe. work. That didn't work <laughs> at all then. That, that, then they blew it. <laughs> but, but just to say that for me, even if they fall short of the expectation, already the, the, we have to see how many people do they manage to, gar to garner and whether, whether it's going to be a successful exercise. In general, the exercise is a communication exercise. Nobody expects any result from the summit in sense of peace decisions, some the decisions about the progress in the war, what's going to happen to the future, what's going to happen to security of Europe. It is indeed 
a purely image communication exercise. And in that way, maybe would maybe it's a message, including from by the US, that better concentrate your efforts on something that can actually yield results, like, for example, reconstruction meetings or the, uh, the reconstruction summit in Berlin or the Washington summit, hopefully hopefully leads also oh, results. That's I, the big one also that we forgot. So. Elizabeth Bro, did you hear that? There's a fourth summit. We didn't mention it yet. <laughs> it's the NATO summit taking place. Uh, actually, it's due to begin the day after the second round of uh, French uh, legislative elections. We'll know then if the far right's in power or not in this country. Uh, is that the big one? Well, it is the big one as, as far as NATO is concerned, but it's not going, it's not going to, to lead to any breakthroughs when it comes to the Ukraine war. And, and uh, since we are also discussing people who, who will not be at various summits, uh, the Washington summit will be just a few days after the UK election. So it's, uh, it's uh, who will participate from the UK government is, is still shrouded in mystery, and we may not know until the day of, of the summit, as this day the summit begins, who will represent the UK. But... Um, the Washington summit really is about NATO itself. And yes, there will be various uh, overtures to Ukraine, uh, shows of support. But uh, this is about uh, decisions uh, about NATO internally, how to, to how the alliance should be set up. It's it's much less about Ukraine. But I think that the the what has changed in these past two years is that uh, Zelensky has become a, a regular guest at various gatherings at which Ukraine would not have been invited, to which Ukraine would not have been invited two and a half years ago. And he's, he's invited us essentially as a star guest and a special guest uh, and not as a full participant. But it's, it's, it is striking because Ukraine is always the, that additional guest that is invited. And, and then when it comes to, to uh, Zelensky losing his Midas touch, that was always going to happen. It was going to be uh, trendy and, and uh, important right at the beginning of the war for everybody to, to support Ukraine. And they wanted to, they felt very passionately about it. It was always the case that that passion was going to wane after a while. And it has waned by the fact that he is continuing these uh, uh, these uh, constant visits to the West uh, is both a sign of the fact that he's invited uh, to the West and other countries. It's both a sign of the fact that he's still invited, still welcome, and of the fact that these countries feel there is still there is still a viable case for supporting Ukraine. If they didn't think there was there was anything more they could do, he would not be invited. Gulliver Craig, uh, briefly here, uh, when on Thursday uh, Volodymyr Zelensky goes to Italy. He'll be representing Ukraine as he speaks, as you've just heard uh, there said uh, by Elizabeth. Uh, he'll be speaking with a, a UK leader who's about to face election, a French leader who's about to face election, and a US president who's also facing an election in November. Uh, has Ukraine done all it can to, to buttress itself for all the various outcomes uh, that it faces uh, among well, its battles. The UK battles. election is not really a worry for them because the Labour Party and Keir Starmer have made it very, very clear that they will continue supporting Ukraine. And Keir Starmer has met Zelensky um, on at least two occasions. I think, of course, what the Ukrainians are most worried about is the US election and the potential return of Donald Trump. And I think they're only now just beginning to realize what a huge risk Emmanuel Macron is taking with these early French parliamentary elections and what could happen if the um, national rally do come to power. They remember Marine Le Pen, the famous loan that her party took from Russia. They also remember Thierry Mariani, one of the leading lights of uh, the um, of them in the, the European Parliament at the moment, who um, is banned from visiting Ukraine because he travelled illegally to Crimea to participate in election observation missions there. And I think he also was in an observation mission for the referendum um, that allowed Putin to extend the uh, term limits and uh, so he's on a blacklist. And uh, those French elections, uh, the French election season just kicking off, we'll be covering the G7 summit right here on France 24, which uh, kicks off in the morning. Gulliver Craig, many thanks for joining us from Kiev. I want to thank Tatiana uh, Nikolenko for being with us from the Ukrainian capital, Elizabeth Bro in Washington, Anastasia Shapochkina. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.